the in Act 91, the first section, Section 29, was uh, a housekeeping piece for the Department of Labor to allow for electronic business registration. It didn't relate to COVID-19 directly. Section 30 was the first really um, important piece there. And what this allowed uh, was two things. Um, it protected employers' experience ratings. Um, and then as a result of that, uh, their unemployment insurance tax rates from being adversely impacted um, by employees who uh, voluntarily quit their jobs for a COVID-19 related reason. Um, so uh, because they had an underlying health condition and the workplace wasn't safe, um, because they had to quarantine, uh, take care of a loved one, something like that. The next thing it did is for employers who had to shut down their operations, um, either because they had a COVID-19 outbreak or due to a uh, public health order from the governor, um, it protected them from uh, an adverse impact on their experience ratings for that. There were two caveats with that though, which we may wanna revisit. And I think you'll wanna to talk to the commissioner of labor about today. Uh, the first was that it was only for eight weeks of experience rating relief. And then any additional time beyond that was left up to the commissioner's discretion. The second point was uh, that they were required to rehire um, the employees afterwards. Um, and this may be problematic in some instances uh, because businesses have uh, been so drastically impacted, they may not be able to rehire everyone that they laid off. And in addition, individuals may have switched jobs during the time uh, that they were laid off. So they may not be able to recapture all of those employees. So that language may need to be adjusted now. Um, and I think we, in my conversations with the commissioner, I think they're going to propose those two changes, but we'll find out earlier. Yeah, I think that's, that's my early impression as well, but I think that's better for them to talk about. Um, section 31 uh, authorized individuals to quit their jobs for certain COVID-19 related reasons and still be eligible to receive unemployment insurance benefits. Um, so this, these are reasons such as needing to care for a loved one who's sick, needing to quarantine uh, because the, the school or daycare where your children are has closed due to COVID-19 uh, and you need to stay home and take care of your children. Um, and so this basically allowed those individuals to be eligible to receive unemployment insurance benefits if they had an eligible reason to quit. Could you go, uh, through, the, could you go through those reasons? I, I sure. Know, I know there was one sentence that had a, a laundry list of reasons. Yeah, let me um, pull up. This is the Act 91 here. Um, All right, so the, here are the reasons. The, um, so they are self-isolating. Uh, they're caring for or assisting a family member who's self-isolating or quarantine, quarantining um, because they've been diagnosed with COVID-19. They're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. They've been exposed to COVID-19 or they're in a specific class or group of persons who have been identified as being at risk if exposed to or infected with COVID-19. All of those same reasons apply if it's the individual employee themselves and not their family member. So they've been exposed to COVID-19 or they're at high risk or they're sick with it. And then the other piece here is like I said, uh, to care for or assist a family member who's left in employment because of uh, an unreasonable risk that they could be exposed to uh, or become infected with COVID-19 at their place of employment. So uh, for example, if you have a family member with a uh, respiratory issue and their doctor has recommended that they isolate at home, um, particularly if they are uh, 
at, at high risk and unable to go out, you may have left employment to take care of them or assist them. Um, and then there is left employment to care for a child under 18 because the school or child care has been closed um, or the child care provider is unavailable due to a public health emergency related to COVID-19. So for children in, for example, a home daycare, um, the, the home daycare closes down because uh, either the daycare provider or a family member of that provider is diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, or required to quarantine. Um, and again, these all apply to the individual uh, as well here. So here's the laundry list for the individual, which is the same list as we went through uh, below. So a couple of things uh, for Senator Rahm's uh, benefit, I she probably knows this, but the number of people that are qualifying for unemployment in a certain business impacts your experience rating. And so the charge to the, the business goes up if they've laid off workers uh, and uh, unemployment insurance has been paid to those workers. Uh, and that's the first section relieves those people of those charges. There's um, things that we generally, we call socializing the costs. So it gets spread across all employers as opposed to that individual. Like we have laws on domestic violence. If you have to leave for a reason like that, that costs, that, that, uh, that charge wouldn't be um, on the employer. So um, I guess I'm curious, I don't know if you can talk to this or this is, this is something we definitely want to hear from the commissioner about. A lot of those reasons that you've put forward there could be temporary in nature. What is the responsibility after two or three weeks for the employee to go back? Or uh, I know there was something you said about uh, the lack of chargeability would be for eight weeks or in the discretion of the commissioner, it could be extended longer. And I'm assuming that he's extended that longer in a lot of cases. Um, uh, but um, what if you, the quarantine one, for instance. So you quarantine for 14 days. After 14 days, are you required to go back? Or what's going on in the real world there? Do you know? So um, the, the issue here with these is these are instances where you might need to quit your job um, in order to do that because you don't have leave available. Um, there is a federal leave law that was put into place temporarily. Um, that allowed people to take time off uh, uh, up to two weeks um, for things like quarantine uh, or to care for a loved one. Um, and so that, that leave law was put in place and then you get up to 12 weeks for uh, childcare uh, total when you, you use that law. The um, eight weeks of relief uh, just to clarify, and I wasn't clear about this before, uh, was that this applied to the employer shutdown reasons. So the employer could shut down or temporarily lay off its staff for up to eight weeks um, in order to uh, um, and then be relieved of benefits. Um, so it's the, the way the law reads is an employer shall be relieved of charges for benefits paid to an individual for a period of up to eight weeks uh, if the employer temporarily ceased operations uh, in response to a public health authority request um, or a state of emergency declared by uh, the governor. Um, so that's, that's for a, a temporary shutdown for an individual worker who has is at high risk or taking care of a, a child, that rate relief continues indefinitely, even without the commissioners. That's uh, correct. That's yeah. correct. The important thing here is um, the restrictions on unemployment insurance mean that if you're able to return to work, so you're able and available to return to work and there is a, uh, a reasonable offer of employment. 
So your employer says, okay, you had to be out for six weeks. Um, you weren't eligible for uh, leave. And I, I apologize, I forget the limitations on the leave eligibility, um, but I can pull that up um, for our second half today. Um, but if you're, if you're, you've collected unemployment for six weeks, but now you're able and available to return to work uh, and the, the positions available, you, you cannot stay on unemployment insurance indefinitely. Um, so this is kind of the push and pull that we were dealing with in September where the initial emergency had passed and folks with an underlying health condition might not be able and available to return to work because of a good cause health reason, but other individuals who were on unemployment and now that the positions had become available again were able to return if they didn't have an underlying health condition or other reason, other COVID-19 related reason to stay home. Um, and so that, that was something we discussed a little bit in September. Um, and uh, the commissioner can talk a little bit about what their experience has been with that. Um, but that's something that the federal department has been continuing to emphasize is that um, if, if people don't have uh, an underlying COVID-19 related reason um, that allows the commissioner to waive the able and available requirement, they need to be able and available for work. And if they receive a uh, reasonable offer of employment uh, and reject it, um, and there's no COVID-19 related reason for them to reject it and no other good cause reason for them to reject it. Um, and that, that would be something like uh, they're being hired to temporarily replace union workers who are out on strike or something like that. Um, then they're, uh, then they, they lose their unemployment insurance at that point. So, so t talk to us a little bit about the work search requirement, which my understanding is that's a, po a procedure or policy put in place by the Department of Labor. We didn't change that uh, in law that they had some discretion as to not requiring uh, someone to do a work search during this period. So um, what I'm trying to get at is like a, a classic person who goes out on unemployment and forget about the the special leave program that the feds have set up, but they go out on unemployment because they suspect they've been in contact or or have uh, or have to quarantine for one reason or another, and then they successfully complete the quarantine. I assume there are many many individuals out there who started to get unemployment because of that and are still receiving unemployment even though the quarantine period is long since passed uh, and that is because there's no work search requirement and their former employer hasn't offered or nobody has come to their door knocking and offering them a job so they're perfectly legitimate to continue to receive benefits uh, assuming that um, there is no work search requirement and the commissioner is really better to talk to uh, the issue of the work search requirement um, because uh, I think the requirement for work search has um, been reinstated in certain cases and then I don't know if it uh, was waived again now that the virus is worsening. Um, but I think in the fall, in some cases, it was being reinstated um, because the jobs were available uh, as the economy was recovering. And now that we're seeing the virus spike again, I don't know what the current status of that is. So the commissioner can speak to that. But assuming there's no work search requirement and assuming there hasn't been a reasonable offer of employment made, uh, then an individual could continue to collect unemployment insurance. Um, so, and similarly, um, if, uh, you are carrying out a work search, but you're not finding a job and you're not getting a reasonable offer of employment, you can stay on unemployment, um, uh, as long as you have benefits. So, um, but I see the commissioners just joined us here. So he may be able to answer whether, what the status of the work search requirement is. 
Um, well, let's, uh, Commissioner, thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm, we're going to continue with Damien, and, and our schedule, as you know, is to go to 925, and then we'll break for the floor. We'll have you back. I, I imagine the floor action is going to be incredibly short, so stand by. Uh, but instead of yeah, instead of getting into your testimony right now, let's continue with with uh, with Damien. Um, so okay, let's. Uh, it's a little confusing. We'll clarify that with the commissioner. Uh, but I assume there are thousands of people who are in this category who triggered their unemployment early on with in the virus and either are, are still drawing benefits under the first 39 weeks and then the 11 week extension and just trying to get a classic example of who those people are at this point and uh, whether we need to cut them off or protect them or we, we just need to find out the direction in terms of extending this sunset. Um, so could we just return? I think you had one more bullet up there. I don't know that it was substantive, but. Yep, uh, let me just share my screen again. And all right. So um, the, the next, um, uh, the next two pieces here, section 32 and 33, um, just essentially revert us to the pre-COVID-19 um, law on March 31st. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's an important date for the committee here. If you're going to extend that, um, then you, that's the, um, we need to do that before March 31st. Um, and then section 34 uh, just requires an employer to notify an individual of the availability of unemployment benefits uh, and I believe that was another housekeeping piece to address some of the federal uh, COVID-19 requirements. So the the March 31st date, uh, forgive me, I thought it was March 1st, but the March 31st date, I would think leaves, some, leaves a gap. If we've extended benefits uh, in a general sense for 11 weeks under the new COVID bill, uh, mm -hmm. Some of them were scheduled to end on December 31st or 26th or whatever. Um, and so that's going to take us through the beginning of March. And um, these uh, liberalized policies are all well and good to continue during the pandemic. But if there's no, especially with PUA, which is the federal program for people who otherwise wouldn't have be monetarily eligible for UI, if that's going to end, doesn't do us a lot of good. We have a gap, perhaps, that we have to look at. Um, and I assume the commissioner will talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the federal extension is through March 14th. Um, mm -hmm. But then there are some complicated sort of phase outs with PUA and so forth that I think the commissioner or Cameron can speak to better about how that will work functionally. Okay. So this is a very, I mean, it's already very detailed, but it's still very preliminary here. Uh, um, does anybody, Keisha or anybody else have any questions at this point uh, of Damien? We're gonna be on this for a while, so just, go ahead. Keisha? Um I don't know if my questions are for, for Damien or the commissioner, so I just thought I'd mention three questions I had and we can take them up after the floor so people have some time to think about them. One is I was actually curious about, I think the first bullet point on electronic registration of businesses. Um, that seems like a very valuable opportunity, which I think the Secretary of State's office is taking advantage of to collect more demographic and geographic information about who those businesses are. So I was wondering, you know, where that is and if that's part of a federal requirement um, around these programs. Two is language access. I think this is a question for the commissioner around the requirements uh, for language access and their protocols right now around people who don't speak English who call their office. And three is general demographic 
uh, information, who's taking care, who's dropping out of the workforce because of childcare reasons, you know, who's getting sick at work. Um, I would imagine that's a federal requirement to have that demographic information. I hope we can explore it as we explore our policy around this. So those are my three questions. Good, thank you for that. Uh, anybody else and Damien, if you wanna add anything, we'll, if not, we'll move on to the workers comp issue in the remaining 10 minutes we have. Okay. Okay. Uh, walk us through what we did last year on the presumption. And uh, I think I got the date right on that one. It's January 15th, right? When it sunsets. That's correct. So this is a little bit um, more pressing. Um, so let me just pull this up. Okay. So and, um, uh, uh, Michael, uh, yes. may I ask Nathan a favor? I know Nathan, we're, we're brand new here, but um, often we post by day. So each we list the day and then all documents uh, and witnesses are listed, uh, anything they present to the committee that day. So uh, the summary, Damien's summary would be great to put up on the website under today's date, under Damien's name. So each witness, when they have things, that, that would be great so that we can look at them uh, if, you know, as we're working through this. Yeah, Nathan, I'll, I'll send you uh, the file and links to the two bills when we're- Yeah, and, this, uh, and just the summary, the bullets sorry. and stuff that are, are, would be helpful. Yep, yeah. I'll send that to him as well. And let me apologize, I meant to, introduced uh, Nathan to the, the committee. I assume that several of you have spoken with him directly, but uh, I, I really enjoyed the first week I've had with Nathan. I think he's gonna be a great asset to our committee. And uh, uh, I hope you will all reach out to him and have a one-on-one -on -one with him just chatting a little bit uh, as we go forward this week. Okay, Damien. Okay, so uh, this is Act 150, which did two things. Um, the first was here in Section 1, it gave the, the Department of Labor administrative flexibility. Damien, um, I didn't realize the time. I see it's yeah, now. Yeah, okay. it's 9 it probably doesn't just... make sense to jump right in here. We'll, we'll pick right up there at that point uh, when we come back and we'll hear about five or 10 minutes about that, and then we'll move to the commissioner. 